Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Hope you got here OK. I'm Jeremy. Uh, I introduced myself yesterday. I'm here with uh, Greg and Charlie. Greg, I don't know if you had a chance to do introductions yesterday because you weren't here. Could you just tell people briefly uh, your role? Uh, yeah, so I'm an assistant uh, director for technology and research innovation and press, which means I get the fun stuff, uh, work involved technology and assessment. We're going to tell you about game-based measurement uh, and uh, in early learning at PBS Kids and some of the implications it has for our efforts into personalized and adaptive learning experiences. Uh, so quick map of the talk. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about PBS Kids, some of the background I think you'll need to understand what it is that we're up to. Give you a little bit of background on Crest. Uh, and then I want to talk uh, conceptually and from a component perspective about some of the learning analytics platform work that we've been doing, because uh, that, that sort of sets the backdrop for some of the specific efforts uh, and research that we've been up to. And then we'll talk about some of our prior work, transitioning into our current work, and some of the studies that we have planned uh, for later this year and next year. So some background on PBS Kids. Um, huge existing audience, millions of kids coming every month to a number of different platforms, web, mobile, broadcast, video online, OTT, you name it. Millions and millions of kids are coming every month. Uh, last year, we served billions of video streams through our players. And we reach 65% uh, of all kids in our target age range, two to eight, uh, during the course of, uh, of a month. So huge existing audience. want to make that point. Um, we are on a number of different platforms. The key strategy there, from a media perspective, is to try to be everywhere that the kids already are, whether that means um, desktop for web, or whether it means watching TV or OTT, whether it means mobile devices uh, and uh, technology that uh, gets adopted in the classroom like whiteboards or, or Chromebooks and so forth. So if the kids are there, we're trying to be there as well. Uh, it also in includes contexts. So be where the kids are, uh, if they're at home by themselves, if they have a peer or a sibling or a caregiver, a parental unit, uh, we want to take that into account. If they're out and about in the world, maybe at the grocery store, if they're at any of the community events that we uh, put on through our local member stations, uh, for example, WTTW here in Chicago, uh, we want to have uh, media strategies uh, that take those into account and really try to support those modes. Um, and uh, the characters and the worlds and these uh, beautiful sets of rules that the kids love, they become sort of instantiated in their, in their heads. Uh, and so we really take pride in all of the, the top quality intellectual property that we create and, and that we have um, distributed. And so we actually don't create it at PBS. I sort of want to make clear that we're in partnership with a number of production entities, for example, the Fred Rogers Company might help us with uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood uh, and so forth. So we, we've got properties that focus on social and emotional learning, properties that focus on animals and biodiversity, uh, book properties, uh, that, for example, Curious George uh, focuses on engineering and sometimes math. Pinkalicious is an arts uh, curriculum. Cat in the Hat is an engineering and science curriculum. Uh, a wide gamut of curriculums. Uh, and a wide gamut of uh, really high quality media. Uh, and how do we get it out? We've got a number of existing distribution channels that we curate and cultivate, uh, whether it's our website uh, or our video app, uh, available through all the app stores for free, or our games app, hundreds and hundred, uh, hundreds of games available for free through the app store, or our other apps in our catalog, or whether it's the ways that we contextualize the media that we make for kids, uh, for parents, through the PBS Kids for Parents website, or how we contextualize that uh, kid-facing media for educators through the PBS Learning Media property. We've got a number of different tendrils going out. And in the end, I would say that what ties it all together is a belief in the ecosystem around the child, not just of the child, but also the adults and all the social interactions that go into that around engaging with the educational media. Um, Another tiny bit of backdrop I really wanted to offer so you sort of know a little bit more about why and what we're up to. The U.S. Department of Education has uh, uh, funded us uh, through a Ready to Learn grant. Um, it's $100 million over five years. It's the fifth consecutive such Ready to Learn grant that PBS has been awarded, PBS and CPB in partnership. Uh, that's the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'll do logo salad here in a minute. but the. This idea uh, is that you could wield public media and wield media creation for kids to promote learning outcomes. And each five-year cycle has a different focus. This one is on science and scientific inquiry. 
uh, as well as some specialized literally, literacy uh, aspects. In this case, it's informational text. So each time we get sort of a, a key focus and there's uh, perhaps one or two, maybe three invitational priorities associated with those things. In this case, the one that's relevant to this group is the focus on personalized and adaptive learning. In other words, the Department of Education would like to know, uh, would like to learn what we can about how to personalize learning, how to individualize learning, how learner-led and system-led behaviors could promote engagement outcomes and promote learning outcomes. So that's the, the key focus of the Ready to Learn grant and why uh, PBS and PBS Kids is able to work with an entity like UCLA Crest. Uh, Logo Salad Corporation for Public Broadcasting is our partnership in this grant, um, working with uh, uh, Department of Ed regularly, of course. But there, I just want to mention a few other entities briefly. We spend about a quarter of the, the money on research. So that's a, a large chunk of change over five years. And we have partners including EDC, SRI, UCLA Crest, Rockman et al, and more. And they help us with everything across the gamut uh, of research designs that you might anticipate uh, being valuable for the creation of educational media for children. That starts with play testing, usability and appeal testing, formative and content studies, small content studies, eventually moving into evaluation and, and summative. Uh, one thing we have not done a lot of that we are interested in growing more around is the longitudinal study of this stuff. Uh, Okay, thanks uh, for letting me sort of get some of that backdrop out of the way. And I'll hand it over to Greg just for a minute. I, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about UCLA Crest. All right, thank you. Um, so just quickly, uh, you know, we, what we bring, I think, to, to this project is expertise in use of technology for graduate purposes. So um, you know, whether it's simulations or games, uh, how do we connect <coughs> what we think is going on with people's heads to their interactions with the game or simulations? So going through that whole analysis process, from construct definition to uh, behavioral indicator formation from Tony to Jane. Uh, and then uh, just a general, um, in general, we, we do research uh, in military context, in education context, training, uh, uh, from pre-K to adults. Um, I joke, my model is from math marksmanship. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, we do the RCT next semester. Can you say what the relation between military and education is? Oh my God, it's like <laughs> I mean, it is like um, at a certain level, they're the same. Uh, you know, military training is about uh, effectiveness, uh, train just enough to get somebody to do uh, some job. Um, but you know, interested in technology, interested in adaptive systems, interested in feedback. So all the instructional issues that we encounter in education to apply to, to the military. But also, we go from the military, who kind of created the whole instructional design system back to education. Um, and it's really interesting when we have an intersection, like marksmanship, where we, we measure like, skills with sensors, but then we bring in the educational assessment framework, like what's going on here, how to transfer, transfer to like if, if the armed forces were to say find out that students were not scoring sufficiently on the ASVAB to make them confident that they'd be able to operate the next generation of tank, for example, the, the Army might get really interested in early childhood education. Yeah, so really the same. Well, it has, right, already. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's quite a, a real, few aren't a real thing. able to pass the ASVAB. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, another piece of uh, background I, I'll point to is our learning frameworks at, at PBS Kids. Um, they stretch across a number of curriculum topics. Uh, they serve us in an ontological fashion. They help guide our curriculum strategies. They help guide our library sciences strategies. And perhaps most relevant to this group, they help us with our evidence classification as we get new and more evidence. Um, I'll show you in a minute, but our learning frameworks get pretty granular, and in many cases, they can be expressed in terms of per, uh, small performance, micro performance outcomes. So allowing us to sort of make media that aligns to our framework, so design guidance, but then also as we get uh, measurement and, and assessment information, lining that up with the things that we thought that the units were teaching. Uh, okay, uh, I also wanna make a point that while we have many different frameworks, at the center of all of it is uh, social and emotional 
learning, social emotional awareness. So while we have several domain specific frameworks, uh, we try to teach all of that. We try to convey information about all of those topics using social and emotional uh, context and relationships between uh, people that are modeled in the games and in the media and so forth. So it pervades everything and we have a social and emotional learning framework itself that has its own learning targets on it. That's an important point. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of frameworks, very granular. Uh, I talked about how they service. Uh, I guess one more point I would say is the way that we create them is typically an expert driv uh, driven process. If there's a relevant standard, uh, we try to uh, uh, consult that standard. Uh, we'll get uh, advisors and experts that worked on those standards to help us. Typically that involves aging the standards down. Uh, there might be a standard that exists for math, uh, for example, but it doesn't quite get down to the youngest in our target age range. And so how can we get people like uh, Herb Ginsburg and Art Baruti and Skip Fennell that worked on some of the, the, the key ideas and, and help us sort of interpret that down into our age group. So this just give you a flavor for some of the work that we do around the creation of our learning frameworks. <clears throat> leading me up to our learning analytics platform. Okay, conceptually, kids are at the middle of it all. We're collecting the data, we're putting it on store, and we're doing some interpretation of it. We'll talk more about that uh, later. And the reason we're doing it is because we believe that we can serve a number of different audiences uh, by the extraction of useful tidbits of information depending on the use. We do quite a bit these days with the researchers and academics, and, and we're getting better now at informing game design itself, like doing regular feedback loops into the creation of the media. We have not done much at all with the data for formal educators or informal educators, but we do have some products available uh, to the public for free uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit that try to bring parents uh, closer into the loop and with better understanding, better visibility into the child's engagement with the media and with the learning topics. The strategy being that if we can get the parent to understand what the child is doing and learning, that we might be able to change the parent's behaviors in ways that promote outcomes for the child. Again, an ecosystem and a social strategy. Um, from a component perspective, uh, there's lots of machinery that we bake into uh, any individual piece of media. We've got a collector going. It's really great at scale. It's really great at throughput and bursting. We've got a cold store. It's engineered to keep data around for as long as possible, for as cheap as possible. The idea here is that I would like to be able to support ad hoc analysis of this data pursuant to any new hypothesis that someone comes up with across time for as long. I, I want to future proof myself to the extent possible and permit uh, future study for people that are having great ideas that haven't been had yet. Um, we'll talk about some of the design of the telemetry that supports that. It's not perfect, but so far we've got a pretty good record of getting data sets on file that support extended uh, realms of study. Got a hot processing chain, so every new tidbit of info that's coming by will do a little bit of uh, analytics. A subset of uh, our, our total analysis can run in, in real time or near time and can send off signals to other uh, products, can send off signals to reporting applications, can send signals back to the game, those kinds of things. I'll talk more in detail about that. There's an interesting aspect. We don't believe that we're going to be the one-stop shop for interpreting this stuff. How could we be? We're, we're a distribution and media company. So we've got an end partner strategy going where I would like to be able to bring in smart folks and entities whose goals are aligned with ours into the data processing chain so that they could provide analysis, so they could provide intelligence that we then feed back into the system. So how can we bring other smart minds? Crest is one such group of smart brains. We're also working with entities like Kidaptive. Uh, 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 their work uh, came out of some folks from Stanford, I believe. They're a Silicon Valley company. Also, Enlearn, uh, which is uh, out of the Center for Game Science at the University of Washington. I don't know if you guys know Zoran Popovic. But uh, we've got folks, uh, uh, other entities helping us with this. Okay, so, and this is sort of on the edge of where we are today. We're just beginning to try to aggregate uh, uh, bits of inference and, and descriptive statistics and other things that we think might be useful into going into a high dimensional vector representing an individual. Uh, so we're prototyping learner profile systems. So that would aggregate evidence across operationalizations of different constructs, across different assessments, across time, across platforms, across experiences. 
Um, but to do that, you've got to have a really good strategy for being able to distinguish between individuals at the lowest level of obligation and then higher on up, possibly having full account systems uh, that allow you to, to file the evidence and retrieve it and so forth. Which means if you're in a publicly facing world, you've got to uh, deal with parental consent. And we believe very strongly in safety and privacy. And we try to rise above even the standard of, of, of the law uh, with respect to that. Uh, all with the idea of informing behaviors in the game, informing uh, messaging and communication strategies uh, focused on uh, parents or, and or educators or the adults that have a vested interest in the outcomes for the child. Uh, and that's across our distribution platforms. Okay, that's the component view. Yes, I was going to say. So uh, it sounds like you're providing information to the parents, but will you also collect information about what the parents are doing and what kinds of actions? Yeah, we've, we've got telemetry specs on at least one product right now that's intended to be used by parents so that they can retrieve and use that information. And we are uh, actually in data collection right now on a study with that product in tandem with a, a child product that connects in real time. I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, we have telemetry on parent use of recommendations associated with the near time kid use of a kid facing product. What about the parents' environment? I mean, some measure of the home in addition to what immediately the parents are doing with your product. Currently, very limited, I would say, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, we're so not. You wouldn't know kind of what, you know, what effect you might be no, having. No, but that kind of background information would be amazing. Like, that's the kind of thing we should right. be thinking about. I mean, do you have plans to do that? Or? Not currently, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't consider it. Okay. We've got some discretion in terms of what the out years of the grant do in terms of study. Because we see in some of these analyses tremendous changes in family structure. I mean, in family approach to the child. Yeah, based on, oh, sure. Intervention. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Poverty, how many words. Uh, yeah, no, exactly, yeah. but also just literally the, the change in the parental strategy. Change in the strategy. Yep. Anyway, we can talk. Yeah, about no, that's great. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to talk more. One of the things that I would like to get out of this meeting, the selfish aspect from my perspective, is I would love to crowdsource ideas about the highest value study that we might permit on data sets like this. Because, from my perspective, there's more that we could possibly ever do, represented by the data sets we're collecting. So, where's the high? What's the high value? Like, I, I'd love to hear opinions about that. But right now, you're not, I mean, the parents are part of it, but you're using them to leverage what you're doing. I mean, how, did, how act, well, I don't want to focus. Yeah, just on no, that. it's okay. The, the, so the short version is we ha are doing ethnographic studies of parents and their environment, but it's not connected with this data and telemetry study. So I won't, I won't be able to line it up. We do have distributions, and we do have an idea of our audience, especially Title I and low income, and what we, we try to focus on the underserved. And so we know a lot about sort of what's going on, but this particular data telemetry study we're going to talk about isn't, isn't lining up. Maybe. Um, OK, so what does this all mean? I, I see many times from a marketing perspective, from a techno-optimist perspective, folks that will try to get up in front of you and say, we've got all the answers. I don't want to say that. What I want to say is we love the question. So the, the idea behind this platform is to really scrutinize and try to help us discover the models, discover the things that uh, are predictive and, and discover the patterns that are important. And so, how, so a lot of our thought is around how, we don't think we have the answer, so how can we go about systematically dis discovering the answers? Um, there's a lot of tooling involved. Uh, there's an open source library that we have called SpringRoll. It's got tools for building games, uh, inspecting telemetry in, in real time, and doing all sorts of other uh, things related to accessibility, like captioning and so forth. We tool everything we can think of because we've just got this never-ending pipeline of game production and stuff. And the, every bit of efficiency we squeeze out of tooling actually pays us back many-fold. Um, so there's tooling in terms of uh, modeling our learning frameworks and making those available on uh, APIs, there's tooling around uh, content management systems for creating and managing ev evidence specifications for any individual uh, game. There's tooling around, this is Legos for analytics basically. This is a custom product that we built for ourselves called Boson. And any individual unit of computation can be managed separately and the directed graphs of processing and dependency chains can all be managed and traced and, and, and viewed and edited. And if you Think about some of the ideas that have been raised um, earlier in, in the, the event. 
the bottom line raw data is super granular and how, there's a key challenge involved in getting up in, into more and more semantic levels of meaning. And I think I heard Ms. Levy talk about how maybe one level of meaning is what's meaningful in, in the context of the game itself and maybe the next level might get you closer to some of the constructs in your learning frameworks. And there might be next level above that, there might be patterns across those kinds of things. And with a structure like this, you can model, you can model any arbitrary uh, analytic like that. So yeah, Legos for analytics. And if you get confused about how it's all working, you can trace and see, okay. Um, oh, right. So let's get into some of the specific stuff. This is a uh, suite of products. Uh, it's called Curious George Busy Day, everybody's favorite monkey, Curious George. Targeted three to five-year-olds on counting and cardinality. Had 16 games that were very tightly clustered in a tiny little sub map of our learning framework around counting and cardinality for this age group. Um, <clears throat> only about half of them, though, uh, allow the children to exhibit judgment. And we studied a subset of these. I think three? We're going to talk about three. Is that right? Yeah. Something like that. So, uh, OK, so a number of media strategies associated with all that. But um, I think I'll just skip straight to the assessment strategy for this. There was none. These products were not created <laughs> to be diagnostic. They, it, it just wasn't part of the requirements for it. But later, when we started getting into feature analysis of experiences, we recognized that just by virtue of their des the design of their learning mechanics, there may actually be overlap with quality assessment mechanics. So we decided to study it and find out, did we accidentally make some things that might have assessment properties? <laughs> it's truth. <clears throat> so, that, so here are the 16 games. Um, yeah, busy day. Extremely popular. Millions and millions of kids playing. These games, my favorite is Meatball Launcher, just so you guys know. Um, OK, I'll hand over to Greg. You want to tell him, tell him what's the there there? OK, so um, this is just a, an outline for the next 10 minutes or so. So first of all, uh, I'll talk about some of the, the measures and how we got there. And then one study, correlational study, uh, gameplay measure, uh, standardized test score, mathematics. Uh, qualitative study. Look at game patterns. Okay, can we translate that into a statistical blah, 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 production code? And then Charlie will talk about uh, your network analysis. Okay, so the first one, gameplay measures. Um, so the first step we did is uh, what we call feature analysis, which really means play the game over and over and over to really dissect it. Like what is it about the game that leads to mathematics understanding? What behaviors are evidence maybe of uh, what kids know and can't um, Look at the interactivity. Is it sort of more passive? Is it more interactive? And out of that, um, it, it, we found games that kind of separated in, into two. One exposure, like the bubble pop. Bubble raises up. You hit the bubble, pop. You know, the man in yellow hat says three. So I'm just like clicking on that bubble. But I'm hearing the number. Uh, meatball. Uh, I hit the meatball, <laughs> hit the meatball, <laughs> keep going. And then when I think I hit the target number here, I, I hit the bell, bing, and you get to see that. Uh, so, but this distinction is super important. Uh, and uh, I'll get to that in one slide or two. Uh, okay, so in order to get a game, a measure out of games, we need some television. Our general uh, idea is to you know, event based capture the event, the user initiated the event, or system initiated the event, plus context information that uh, describes the, the game state around that particular event. Um, uh, the other thing is we only want descriptions of behavior, not inferences. So not that uh, a student understands how to count to five. That's later in the analysis. It's just a student clicked on all um, and then uh, the whole idea is, well, can we capture the data to support analyses that we can't even go see? So Jerry's talking about this cold store. Well, there is a huge cold store, but lots of stuff that you got to figure out. Okay, um, all right, so the gameplay measure. Uh, so we ran the study, uh, really three, three questions, right? Uh, well, can we derive measures from the gameplay that relate to students' mathematics knowledge? Uh, 
since you're doing multiple games, can we come up with sort of common measures? And then um, what is it about the game design that helps or, or doesn't for measure purposes? So, you know, super simple measures, right? One class of progress, how far you game you get in terms of time, in terms of load. And then performance measures, um, uh, in terms of game mechanics, like number of correct um, measure was a team of three, uh, which was administered to like, 56 kids that West Ham had done the primary data collection on. Um, yeah, okay. So, what's, you, what's, the, what's the time frame? Uh, I mean, in other words, a, of a c typical game, yeah, you know, maybe a typical sequence here. Uh, I think they did the... Meatball. So, I mean, how long do you play? Yeah, that yeah exactly. And, and how long is it? In general, like, the play on the games might range from just a couple minutes on up to, it's a really engaging game. I don't want people to take that away as to mean that we just sort of automatically get the process that we need for instruction to see instructional effects, because that's not. We don't just automatically get it. Automatically. Yeah, yeah there's, there's an active line of inquiry at PBS Kids about creating packages of media explicitly to get the kind of overall dosage you need. Right. To see um, yeah, that was the next question, uh, just the recursive feedback. I mean, you can design the game if you're really trying to keep a monitor or measure, you can see how well you've attained it and then maybe even switch games. Right? Yeah, yeah. And there, so in this set of products, we don't have the feedback loop in there. I see. These are created before we even started this work. We're just setting it at this point. But we will talk about the, the feedback loop. Uh, and I also am hearing you talk about incentive structures and motivational structures. That's another key line of inquiry at BBS Kids. Um, how do you incentivize productive struggle uh, and allow failure to mean the productive things that it can mean, especially in systems of elimination, or even just the earliest stages of exploration, for example, messing about, that kind of stuff, when people are unfamiliar with the cause and effect model by a simulation, but choose to do random behaviors in order to uncover the cause and effect that's actually modeled. Uh -huh. So, I mean, these, these games would be played like these kids are in preschools or? Yeah, or not. Because or not. they might not even have preschools. Right? right, so they could just, you could do this at home. Yes. And, and, and what's the compliance rate? And then, would you offer them the game? How many, what percentage of the kids actually uh, participate? I don't have that off the top of my head. We'd probably have to form a question along the lines of how, out of, it's such a complicated answer. I don't know. How about this? hundred percent of the kids in my house play the game. Yeah. <laughs> we also are heavy funders of a PBS. So a typical entry point would be a kid rolling up to one of our aggregation experiences like the website or like the PBS Kids Games app and then choosing what they want to do in a world with lo a large number of options. Uh -huh. And they're self-selecting in. So what I probably could pull would be numbers around in a, in a given fixed time period, how many are choosing to go into this particular product as opposed to that. Right. That's the kind of thing I can characterize. Okay. You know if the uh, kids are using it on phones, tablets, or computers? Or? It, this particular product was made before the transition to, to mobile, but uh, all of the stuff that we make for learning to learn these days, uh, typically it's a mobile first design. Yeah. So the, there's a couple strategies involved. One is make sure that if you are, as a kid, if you're wielding a mobile browser, that it will work, but that's clunky and, and not the best. We also have the tooling of, of Springroll allows us to create one technology embodiment of an interactive and turn it into an IPA for the Apple App Store, turn it into an APK for the Android Store, turn, turn it into a, a web deployable resource. Or, for example, our Games app itself is an app that can embed any of these individual modules. So now we've got the ability to nest at our as well. So we can, we can package it anywhere. It, it now it comes down to okay, great, you have the capability to do whatever you want. What are the right, what are the right strengths? Uh, do, do you have any interest for parents using like a resource of their own to maybe set a goal for the child? Yeah, that's and, a, yeah, that's something we're thinking about. Okay, it's early on that, um, and not just parents, also educators. One of our key tendrils is uh, supplemental use in the classroom and provide additional materials uh, so that educators can make. Good use of these things, and I could have. I, 
given the ability to aggregate dynamically any subset of our library, and given a particular mandate for this individual teacher, like a goal for this teacher, I could easily see them sort of going through our curriculum or our learning framework, choosing the things that interest them, and providing a, a kid with an individualized learning framework. That, that's where we're at. Because it'd be really interesting to have some, to learn about some incentive structure that either the parents are using to try to get the child to exert effort. I thought, yeah. Free has been, I know it works on me. <laughs> Have the capability to conduct experiments so you could tell one parent, give them a set of instructions and a similar kid's parent, different set of instructions and compare? In, in a limited fashion, but that's also on the roadmap. The experimentation system, the end state of the, the system that's under development right now will allow us to run very fast randomized control trials. So, what we're talking about here specifically is an ability for someone like you to pull up a chair to an admin, create a new experiment select the interactive that we're interested in, select a sampling strategy, yeah. in order. select an end per condition, and then either manually or set up a, uh, some dynamic controls for each of the configurations that's, that each configuration would require. And then at the distribution platform level, because we also control that, build the machinery required to do the proper sampling, do the proper tagging, and, and have the product be able to reach out and say, am I part of an experiment? Yes, which one, you know, which one, oh, this one. Which condition am I in this condition? What configuration does that mean I need? You need this configuration. Okay, now spin up. We're, it's going to take me, that's probably going to take 18 months before we're like really there. You might want to suggest this, but do students have uh, great accounts where you can tell where how to do it on their first uh, ever playthrough of the game? And then, of course, because you might probably have some uh, uh, selection into kids who continue playing. Yeah based on them being good yeah. enough. Distinguishability and identity is key to all of this working. Uh, but you can't ask a kid that can't read yet or understand, or a kid that doesn't understand virtual identity to create a full account. Um, at the same time, even kids who can, if you want them to create an account, it doesn't mean that they want to create an account. So they have to want to create an account. In fact, motivational structures, reward structures, and so um, and so there are a number of different strategies in play that all, when taken together, constitute our actual strategy, which is what they're able to do, what can we make them want to do, and then we, that now we have that level of distinguishability or, or identity. So we do have account systems. You can create full credentialed account systems, uh, safe, private, uh, but not that many kids do, unless we go out of our way to make pieces of media that they can create themselves and then save. When they self-express their own identity through interactives and can save their own user-generated content, then they actually care enough to go do that kind of thing. But until we make something that they understand and care about, it's pretty much a non-starter. But separating out from uh, parents, sorry, students that play uh, at their homes yep. with their parents, with students who play at, for instance, preschools, mm -hmm. you could get a sense of, you know, Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good idea. It's not something we've done yet. But if I'm hearing you, what, I'm, what I think I'm hearing is maybe our identity system could also support some research-oriented tagging so that if I was a preschool teacher, I could actually set up the accounts and give myself a, a group ID and that that would travel with the data so that later on when we're selecting and grouping by and all that kind of stuff, we could actually be able to sub subgroup on that. <laughs> It was about randomization actually and initial ability assessment that I think you're yeah. So far, sensitive. we're very hand wavy about sampling strategies. The only good one I know I'm going to go after is as random as I can make it, but I don't know what other ones. I feel like we could potentially use IP address to reverse look up geo and that kind of thing, but I can. Well, I was actually thinking about changing the games, right? So, you know, you were, I guess you're getting there, but some features of the game have differential impact on strategies, so mm -hmm. learning success, etc. Yeah. And you could randomize within these games, right? Whether you get this kind of feedback or that kind of feedback. Yes. And using that randomization, what you exclude is that the path that you observe is actually endogenous to the to the game itself, right? Yeah. So once you say enter step four, everybody's kind of like the same, but now subject one gets, you know, the bell or whatever it is, and subject yeah. two gets, you know, another. Now you can compare. And, and if that is random, at that point in time, you can get, you know, <coughs> some causal yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Right, right now it's all self-selection into Ooh, the game. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> But and also and organization and, and, and kids wouldn't model. notice, right? Kids wouldn't actually see the difference, right? It's just a slightly different game, but... Yeah, if you... Uh, some of the things I want to test, though, would require me to create a condition that would be pretty bad from a gameplay perspective. Uh, so sometimes I want, you know, I think there's opportunity there for sure. I just also think that to some extent in a world where they have choice, I might be handcuffed a little bit in terms of the conditions that we can make make sense for the kid. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So these are just simple correlations by very between uh, the gameplay measure and the outcome of this point, the THV score. And the idea was, all right, these are kind of common measures across games that we like to visualize. So the, the first thing we saw correct first event. So the very first time uh, the child did something and we can evaluate that something. So not, and then the second column is like, all right, we just add them all up. So that, that seemed pretty promising. Uh, and then Eric thought we were super informative. Uh, more incorrect. Lower your uh, map knowledge score. Uh, and then in terms of the game, Meatball launcher look pretty good, right? It's like, holy, holy smokes, right? How, why is this game different from these other two? Well, to, so this gets to this, kind of the, the game design aspect. So, what is that 0.67 game now? Uh, the Take correlation meatball. between the gameplay version, which is max number of levels, and, and uh, team of team of three. Selected items from a standardized test called the team of three, which is the test for early mathematics ability for this game. I see. So this is really a math assessment. Yeah. 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 Actually, I'd like to suggest one, one other feature where make you don't have any initial ability level, right? No. But you could have a before people get get into it, have a very you know fun task which would allow <laughs> you to classify you know initial ability, which would you know make these inferences much more valuable. Yeah. I'll yeah. Actually, we'll talk about that in, in I think the third product. Just at the, at the and it could be fun, right? I mean, it should be a game in itself, but it's actually an assessment of yeah. the But you're following these people. You can use it, follow these people over time, even within the course of one meatball launch of game. Yeah. Right? So you have a baseline, sort of, with any trial. Yeah. yeah. To the extent that we expected a, a growth model to be in, in effect right. across one session. So if I give this meatball game repeated, as soon as I have a five year old kid, kindergarten. Would I be able to infer then the mathematical ability is increasing in the course of the, uh, the, the, the semester or whatever? Yeah, if you believe in your instantaneous measure. Yeah. And how well correlated are these measures with performance? You have this math item, right? But I mean, how well does it accord with other, I don't know, this item in particular? Than that. But we will talk about another product in a minute that aggregates multiple games of this scale. It's huh. got like a, a dozen uh -huh. games and five specific assessment interactives and a number of open-ended sandboxes that allow exploration of the topics. And that's all in one tablet app together. Uh -huh. So we have multiple operationalizations of the similar constructs, all in possibly in one play session. That kind of thing. So we're, we're working towards that uh, in tandem with media strategies that permit. Given that we are in this uh, environment of asking uh, potential things, uh, would you be able to follow them into school and see, for example, whether those who have got the, this very high uh, number of correct first attempts are those who are also performing well in school, for example. Yeah, I don't see why we couldn't do that. It wouldn't be something that we can do by ourselves, and it wouldn't be something where yeah. we would even necessarily want access to the school level information. But the map between our identifiers uh, and the school identifiers, if that was being maintained by a responsible party, I could see a system whereby you could actually do analysis across those, the, the, the joint data set. Right. Yeah. That would be, I think, very informative, which is, right? Yeah, which is why I, I, Absolutely. one I mean, of the themes of this talk is, isn't there potential associated with a surface like this where kids are already by the million self-expressing and, and, right. and exercising their right. But what's the age adapt? What's the grade three version of Meatball Launcher? Is there? 
In other words, these kids are getting, getting skilled. So it, it, a third grader presumably is going to knock off meatball. I'm 43 and I still play meatball. <laughs> 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 we go up to about eight. Um, well, was that just reaction speed or something? <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. That's different. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, that's a good question. Things vary uh, incredibly in terms of approach, instructional approach, as you start adding new child development abilities. Like, for example, if you're in your threes, maybe you have fours, maybe you're just beginning to understand that a virtual identity could exist. If you're, maybe you're just beginning to be able to take the perspective of another human being and put yourself in their shoes. These are the things that sort of arrive over time as a human develops. And I think that at each sort of phase, there's different games that they like and different, different things that are fruitful to try to convey to them and fruitful to try to, to measure. Are you, are you subtle enough to be able to adapt it, though, to the individual child? So say there's a really brilliant three-year-old and a really sluggish three-year-old in terms of meatball launcher. I, I will show you one of our very first attempts to do that kind of thing okay. in a little bit. Um, it's got potential. I think it could work. I think you could work on it. All right, so I'm just going to speed up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. So this, this whole game design thing, yeah, you play it's meatball, it's, it's, it's just like a test. Okay, yeah, I can click that meatball, boing, go, go past the target number, go feedback, and I, and I click the bell, that's when I get the correct or incorrect feedback. All the other games sort of like give you this intermediate feedback model. So that, so, so that, and then we replicated the analysis for some middle school games uh, and, and some adults in terms of the common measures. What's the main level time? Uh, so you're on a level, uh, the mean time you're on a level across people, across levels. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's a, duh, the, the more game condition is like a test condition, you know, then you get like good numbers. Uh, but really in terms of mechanics, you know, opportunity to, to be correct and incorrect, I, I think it's important. Um, and then if these you know, game actions can be evaluated even better, then you've got a built-in score. Um, all right, uh, so I'm just gonna whiz by, I'm just gonna say one thing here and then skip the, the 10 slides. <laughs> so here is like then we, the second set of analyses was Dr. Twin, you, you you can take more time. I just wanted to tell you, I think Dr. Norman can't make it, so you have extra time if you want to go through the slides. <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> All right. yeah, thank you. Right. Is the hotel available tonight? <laughs> so so the second analysis was like human data mining. So look at gameplay patterns, uh, classify them into different categories, and then so that's like human part of quality of the analysis. Then can we develop the statistical rules to run it into categorization? And then can we take those statistical rules, turn it into code that can then go on the production? And then okay, so yeah, I said that. Okay. So really, the, so the reason for this kind of test is like you know. If we can, go through that entire chain, then it's like we can make a bootstrap uh, analysis part. Because, you know, like humans can see patterns really well. Um, so that might be a quick way to interview information and then like the whole data mining thing that takes days and days to make sense of stuff. Okay. Uh, so um, these are just examples of uh, different kinds of uh, Parents. So these are individual uh, plays, uh, and uh, so there's like correct attempts and incorrect attempts, blue bubbles, red bubbles, and the, the numbers down here represent the digits uh, from one to nineteen that kids get exposed to. Uh, so some people just stop. Right? No idea why. Uh, some people go through the entire set of levels that cover all nineteen. Some people stop for the unknown reasons. They're, just correct. They get, they're getting lots of correct, lots of incorrect. Um, some people 
stuff with lots of errors, uh, and some just powder through. Right, so these different classifications. Um, okay, that's that's that. So what do you make of that? Yeah, <laughs> but does it relate to some of the other measures? I mean, when you go across schemes that these people have played in inventory, so some way you're developing a, an inventory of social and emotional skills, or uh, we're at the very beginning of this. This is the, the learner profile work. So I, yeah. I see it in two huge buckets. One is get all of the things you think might be relevant and co-locate them so that you can organize them by. Yeah. And the second is a free-for-all on interpretation. I, I'm not sure what, it, what, what the strategy is there. But we will, in theory, be able to compare this game to that game, this other game to that game. Did they watch this video? Did they not watch that video? What are all the slices and dices you might think were important and then see, see what, what's true about that subject? Is there any way to kind of project these people, get some baseline measure in terms of more, some other, we've talked a lot about Big Five or some other, Inventory is suitably age adapted. Is there some way to look at your measures and relate those for at least a subset? Or I, have you done it? I think so. I think so. I, I think that if you have a player who consistently across operationalizations, different game, okay. consistently exhibits power and through, uh -huh. you might make an argument that that's related to something like conscientious. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, and then there's all the grit and the persistence and the determination stuff. And there's uh, things like inhibitory control and self-regulation that are so important that I think uh, play into some of that. I mean, the Big Five, each term, each label in the Big Five subsumes so many oh, right. constituent concepts. Uh, so I think it would be about m modeling the, the connection and, and being careful that you actually are only getting one tiny little, just one tiny little piece. But, but, the, but the, the end game here is that if you have enough tiny little pieces, then maybe you can make some really great things. Uh, all right, so this is just, um, all right, here's like qualitative coding, here's numbers in terms of uh, you know, translate into SAS code, like statistical stuff. And basically, <coughs> so, so the question is, can we take the uh, qualitative coding and then can we turn that Blah blah blah, so that we can classify the same gameplay between the same categories. So, so that was the you know, kind of the test. So numbers are pretty good, you know, like off by two, off by one. Uh, and then in terms of the math knowledge, the, uh, the playthroughs were significantly higher on the, the math output measure than the other, uh, other categories. But still, the, how do you interpret the categories? And uh, then we went from all right, SAS statistician doing stuff to Charlie. Okay. <laughs> like, can you take that stuff and put it in the code? And then you know, eventually we, we got to, um, uh, which of course I, I care a lot about because ultimately I I need to have a strategy to transition the intelligence that we just developed and, and either power products with it or power reports with it or whatever. So it's got to be able to run in the production environment. That's it. Um, Sorry, you're, you're just putting up frequencies there. I mean, is yeah. that, did you do like a, a classification accuracy analysis? Are these the same <laughs> records getting put into each pen? Uh, I think so. Okay. I, Let's I, check. I hope so. <laughs> 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 Might be good Maybe, to check. Yeah. That's all I'm Might saying. Be worth it to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like you confront it with like any kind of say mining procedure. But this is like human mining procedure. Um, but so far you've done it like game by game? Uh, no, it was just for this game. No, no, I understand. But I'm saying you link performance across multiple games for the same child. Okay. We're working towards that, yeah. For, but that's so far the it's been it's game by game, yeah. Okay. It's specific to the game mechanics in each case, the operation right. that the, as I understand the situated. Well, couldn't you design games that are sort of more intensive and like conscientiousness, more intensive kind of in like curiosity, you know, yeah. open. I'm just, again, using big five, yeah, not in love with it. But absolutely. Yeah. There's a game we have that has nothing to do with math whatsoever. You sit down at a table, 
all of your character friends are there and it's a tea party and you get to hand out cookies uh, and you, you actually get some feed more tea and you get some feedback from time to time so, give any cookies to this person you know and it just sort of observes that and we would actually know if that if you shared equally in the first place and if when prompted did you correct any inequity like so things like that So does the tea party really capture interaction, <laughs> though, among groups? I mean, no, you have a, it's no, a virtual it's, tea party. It's, yeah, these are NPCs, but we do have a virtual world. Well, apart. you still have a virtual player right, yeah. where you're interacting with some yeah. bot out there. Yeah, yeah so we get models. Yeah. Model. And, the, and there is another untapped resource at PBS Kids called Cart Kingdom. It's an online multiplayer world. Many kids are on there at the same time. And the curriculum is a systems thinking curriculum where they're interacting with one another uh, at the same time to build recipes and to construct pieces of their carts and to construct their carts themselves. And the pieces of the carts have different affordances and capabilities. Is that issue? No, uh, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> There's way more to study than we could ever possibly study. Right. How do we do that? Oh, can I ask a question about the oh, profile? So this, the profiles are fascinating. Um, I guess my question is, have you s studied, like, can you, so it sounds like you, you have looked at the data and you saw these and you codified them in some way, and do those codifications apply across different games? So can you, can you measure persistence in each game in a consistent way, or are you thinking um, you can do that? You, I think you could, but we did it. Um, I'm guessing there are many games that you could make a persistence argument. Um, yeah, what, what, what are the long-term goals is to come up with these sets of common measures, common definition, and then which gets uh, operationalized differently in different games because of the uniqueness of the games. I see. But as we get toward that, then start answering questions. It's, yeah. it's a stretch for one single game to sort of be the authority on any construct yeah. level of thing or learning framework. And yet, can you paint a picture with five different operationalizations of that same construct, 10 different ones. Now maybe you start, if, if you got your interpretation of those things down, maybe, maybe you're getting much more confident. Yeah, or you might get much more confident in the sense that they tend to cluster around the same thing, or you might find out that they're very context dependent, and then you know you better not count on any one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and have you incorporated the game, like if someone gives up, do you? someone appear and say, oh, you're giving up already? Keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> we have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, haven't studied th that. There's a couple games that do that kind of thing. Um, haven't studied those that aspect in particular deeply with respect to the time. Okay. Okay. All right, so I am going to talk briefly about our uh, neural network that we uh, built to attempt to predict the team of three score outcome based on the gameplay data. So um, this data set, it, uh, we only have the after gameplay team of three score. Uh, there's no pre, there's no, um, you know, in, like, during gameplay measure. So we're just taking the whole set of everything that's done in the game, making a really long vector out of it. Um, and I think it's like 1,702 indicators. Uh, around each sort of numerical concept. So what Greg was talking about, there's the 19 numbers that appear, up to 19 numbers that appear in each game, and how many times they uh, were exposed to the character saying that, how many times they uh, used that number, uh, how many times they made a correct decision about that number. Uh, so we made a lot of indicators on this, and uh, I don't know why I keep being on my shoulder. Anyway, <laughs> so, I ended up basically just rolling with defaults, right? I, I, Pi Brain has a, like shortcuts, it made it super easy to just make a network in two lines and train it on a third line, basically. And uh, uh, so uh, I used the RPOP minus uh, training algorithm. I did a, uh, a cross validation with eight sets just because it worked out mathematically. <laughs> and 56 cases, eight sets. So, uh, holdouts in each one. Um, and it, and I'll show you on the, I think the next slide, but it is, uh, it's really overfit, right? So there's only 56 cases, it's not great. Uh, but it can, uh, so 
the, the original network that I, before doing all the constant validation. Can you briefly say what you mean with neural network? Um, oh, uh, um, so like uh, this is a. Uh, yeah, I have a, uh, just a, we've got our, our inputs. Uh, uh, so the, the neural network being just a, like a, a regression Predict the uh, we have a gameplay data. Unfortunately, the but graph cuts it off. Assuming you have like a lot of confounding weight variables in there, right? Oh yeah, sure. It's a uh, uh, most of most of. The, uh, How do you what, what what structure do you put on it? I mean, so it's, it's a uh, uh, what I said single layer, one hundred neuron hidden layer, mm -hmm. uh, and then a linear output and single. Layer. Yeah, just si single hidden layer with 100 neurons in it. So, uh, not complicated by anything, not deep. <laughs> just uh, pretty shallow. Uh, and uh, I, I, mean, I did try several experiments with deeper networks and didn't get anything like better. So, uh, in the, because those take so much longer to train, the deeper you go, I just kept it a shallow. And I figured with only 56 cases, I wasn't going to get anything really great anyway. Because why, did, why did you just use 56, though? It sounds like you have thousands of data. Oh, it's a, we only have 56 students that took the team of three assessment. I see, OK. That we have a, a gameplay that says that they played this game, these games right before mm -hmm. they took this team of three assessment. So uh, that's the data set I'm working on. But could you incorporate the team of three into the games to get <laughs> I don't know what that item actually looks like. No, no. But the, so if I understand the question you mean, was the instructional design aligned with the, yeah. yes, it's all aligned with the, the same. Yeah. So I mean, you could include the team of three, say, at the conclusion of a whole game set, and you could have a richer data set for everyone that was interested in taking it, or? Well, we probably have a bunch of kids leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Team of three, how long does it take to take the exam? I don't know. This was a subset of items. Uh, yeah, the subset was a half hour. Yeah. Half hour. Yeah. For, and this is pre K? Yes. It, it's 101. Yeah. Hmm? Researcher and child. I see. But well, that's a long time for. Yeah. There's no way to gamify, Tima. <laughs> uh, well, that's yes. educational games. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The question in my mind is if this diagnostic capability, then you have gamified the team. Right, yeah. right. So you just you predict the team of three score. So you don't need the 30 minute test. You yeah. just basically have them play the game. Yeah, you just use this as a calibration signal. Yeah. 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 And we're, you know, also our mandate is we're very low stakes. When I look in this room, like these kids were super low stakes. All, all I'm interested really is sort of figuring out generally where you are. Going to be doing any kind of accountability work with this stuff or anything. I just want to help guide the, the, the media experience and the instructional experience. Someone giving the as team. As I'm of, close, I'm happy. The team of three, though, is it a, a, a trained educator, a psychologist, or just. Yeah, you have to go through yeah. some training. With the team. Just trying to think of uh, preschool and the ability of just marry this with. But only be like an initial sample. You yeah. get yeah. one large yeah. sample. Then that would be the base. You never have to give it again. No, no, I understand yeah, that, but, yeah. but you're right. Yeah, but your plan is to expand it considerably, I guess. That's, yeah, that's the hope. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. Uh, uh, with this small fund, uh, funding, will like <laughs> well, and if you had the ability the to tie this to school level data, standardized test data from kids at the school level down the road. That I would think could bring a lot of power to it and some significant numbers. So I, I think there's a conversation for us to have yeah, here yeah, because, in terms of that data being able to be tied together, there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. So, one of the things we're going to show you, Otis, later and talk about it, but as Professor Heckman and I have talked a little bit about, is taking an Otis like platform, really putting it into the the pre-kindergarten uh, and nursery school area, we would have to develop it. But we could tie this all in together with you all and, and connect to, in theory, track these kids and watch these kids as they 
get on to kindergarten beyond. Yeah. So well, I agree. One one model we might consider is um, given that we have channels dedicated to the supplemental use of these materials, either in or outside of the classroom by teachers. That if you were to say have a group of teachers and students assign gameplay at home, and you had all the identities lined up, and you had the standardized assessment, uh, then you, you might have great, great setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Minimum burden on teacher. Minimum, yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Because if we get the diagnostic running satisfactorily on the game side of things, then that means you could assign the testing for home. Home, yeah. it, it wouldn't even be homework. My kid, you got to go play. Game, yeah. gotta go play these games at home across this upcoming week. But what's even no more, no stress to the parent, no stress for the teacher. You know. But what's even the interesting is that you could develop lesson plans, which we let that we do, and you could have lesson plans that even kids that aren't in preschool, mm -hmm. you could get the parents to to download a platform and actually start to run the kids themselves through those lesson plans. So. Oh, well. I'm excited to see the results. Yeah, because the, uh, <laughs> the results aren't super impressive. I'm going to tell you that compared to everybody's talk yesterday, I'm just like, oh, I'm so, why is so sad? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, because, so this piece, uh, green marks, the actual scores, the dots are predictions. Uh, a couple of them have uh, uh, two dots on them, and that's where the um, original uh, network overlaps with the, the validation sets. Um, and uh, so the original network is much better. It, I actually had more time to train it, so it actually got a little bit better. And the cross validation, I had less time just because there was uh, eight sets of them. I did not have the uh, time to do them as long. And so this is the uh, uh, the original network uh, mean squared error and the validation across all the validations that mean squared error, which is uh, much higher. And then the uh, the this is only validation. The uh, training sets is, is actually like free for the uh, original one. Um, so it's, uh, it's overfit for sure, right? And then, um, and well, like one of them just didn't, is like, actually, this is actually a slightly negative score. <laughs> so it did not obviously fully learn even the, the space of the problem it's working in uh, in, some, in some cases. So. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it, and I was, I, I did uh, attempt many uh, modifications to it, more complex uh, models, and it did not improve significantly in, in any of those. And, and my conclusion is just, it's just not enough, right? I don't have 56 samples. I'm holding out uh, seven of the validation sets. It's just not mm -hmm. going to do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Do you have a minimum amount of gameplay for inclusion in this set? No, I'm using everyone. And the, so, I, the, the I mean, some of these errors are going to be. The administration of this is that I think they all play for the yeah. approximately the same amount yeah. of time. Oh, they did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this was in, a, in a, like a laboratory setting okay. that came in and they played. The so game. they weren't allowed to quit early. I think they probably they are allowed to. Stop, right? To stop so, engaging. Stop engaging. <laughs> but they had to sit there. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, of course I wasn't, and I don't have like, observa like direct observational data to back up, but for sure they actually right. made it through. Uh, My recollection is that there were a couple of kids that uh, decided to stop and never did anything to do this. It's really hard to say no. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there are a few other ones that I. Uh, mysterious columns in the data set that I tried to um, perform predictions on. One of them was a uh, columns at board. And yeah. it went from zero, zero to two. And I was like, I don't know what, what those mean. But I tried it and got nothing. Could not predict whether they were boards. I'm not sure what the other, what the second board category was. Anyway, so. Uh, and I think that's about, uh, about as interesting as that was. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears. I want to tell you a bit about another product. It's um, called Pubis Kids Measure Up, as well as its uh, companion product called Supervision. Pubis Kids Supervision. All right, Measure Up is for uh, kids three to five. It's a measurement curriculum. And by that, I mean length and height, capacity, and weight. Uh, there's a lot of video 
and there are sandboxes, which are sort of open-ended sims. There are games as we typically conceive them, and then there are what we call challenges for the kids, which are really custom-made assessment interactives, all working together in, into one product. Video is typically uh, wielded for modeling of problem solving and behaviors. Uh, the sandboxes permit exploration uh, and messing about. Games uh, handle some of the instruction, practice, and feedback type loops. Uh, and the challenges are to give us a, a slightly cleaner read on uh, capabilities. And across the entire set of games, across all these things, there are multiple operationalizations uh, of several of the framework constructs involved. All of it is instrumented with the telemetry uh, and it remits and is processed in well, near, near time, uh, which shows up as an activity stream for parents through the supervision app. So this is for pocket device. You just put supervision on your phone and anytime the kid plays measure up, if you've done the sync, you'll get a progress report. And for the games that support proficiency measures, you can tap in and get a deeper proficiency report uh, over time for that game. Uh, so yeah, both progress and performance-based reporting. And the strategy here, uh, always trying to tie assessment in the service of learning at BBS Kids. Strategy here is if you report through to the adults and the family members, uh, that you might be able to uh, change the dynamic around these topics uh, in the household. So Measure Up, uh, it's got a cool island uh, thing going on. Inside each one is a, a sequence of media supervision, again, a sort of feed type thing, and uh, performance reports. Uh, messaging strategies to parents, we did a lot of testing on this sort of stuff, just trying to keep it very simple with a color coding system and just a three tier system. Uh, and there's a, a, a report, and then there's a bit of interpretation as well going on, you can't see, and then there's a, a prediction, uh, excuse me, there's a recommendation down here. The recommendation typically takes the form of either another game, but that's pretty rare. Uh, more often it takes the form uh, of a real world activity that we have produced around the same learning topic. And so you might be counting sugar packets at a diner. Uh, you might be looking at the labels, on, uh, the nutrition label when you're in the grocery store. Something related uh, to the, the curriculum. Um, all of this is the first time we tried to do any of this, including a package that could aggregate multiple games. So this was, I think, probably 12 simultaneous prototype versions. So, so how do you get the kid to get into Measure Up? It's available for free on the App Store. Typically, the use case is the parent notices it because they're looking for an educational right. game. But what, what, I mean, how do you entice the child to oh, get into the system? broadcast. Like social media spots, little bumpers on broadcast, that kind of thing. I see. Okay. Yeah. If I can get access to the mass media channel, that's like done. So the so so and what do you get a sense of if it, you? I'm just getting again going back to the compliance <coughs> question. How many kids? How easy is it to enroll? Suppose you have a you know a, a group of preschoolers so, and you want to target them, say in Los Angeles. Yeah. Community. The, how do I get all of them into this? It, so it's um, it is intended primarily for the home use case, but right. if you were running a preschool and you wanted them to use, yeah. you would go to the app store and you would download it. It's free. Both of these are free. However, However, I mean, they, you could download it, but they may just ignore it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you get them to, 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 to groove out on this? Um, they have to want to. So it's a, right. it's a strategy get involved to, in the design. Right. Make it appealing. These characters that they love. Yeah. yeah. Oh, can't force. And you've experimented with that, though. You know how to entice them? Um, no, I'm just... The people that make the media, I think, do. Yeah, they've got a track record of really great success in terms of getting kids to care. Okay. I, we sink or swim based on the kids' choices. Like we, we, if we don't make something the kid wants to choose over Toka Boca over other things, we, we're we're sunk. So, we, a lot of our effort goes into engagement strategies. In fact, our learning model has a giant engagement factor that multiplies everything. It doesn't matter how good your instructional strategy is if your engagement goes to zero, you're in t you lost the entire game. So everything underpins on getting the kid to care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we try to do it in tr trustworthy ways. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but you would put this on an ad, for example, in a, in a PBS program. Yeah, that's how you do Okay, yeah. so Mr. Rogers could. Yeah. Well, he's not around. Yeah. I would have loved it. The other thing I wanted to say Fred Rogers was a little app with the train going around. They had it. Yeah. Um, 
the, the other thing I wanted to point out is that this is intended for a parental use case. Like the entire brand of supervision is that the mom has got superpowers and that she can see what's going on. So <laughs> if you were running a preschool, uh, you would not necessarily find the user experience here that would help you do class management or grouping or that kind of thing. It's not made for you specifically. You could probably get by and get some value out of it. But that kind of experience is something we have yet to do and that we're interested in doing. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. It, you run through adventures, everything, well, lots of things on the screen. You can tap and get some cool measurement related things. Uh, it's, a, it's a cool product. Uh, this is the package of media in Measure Up. So I've got uh, interstitials, I've got assessments, I've got open-ended sandboxes, I've got games, I've got all sorts of things all lined up into zones, and in, uh, they're sequenced intentionally based on the curriculum, and the assessments are placed uh, at just the right uh, points in time. And so some of these games might actually have diagnostic capabilities. We're doing some data collection now, uh, where we're going to get telemetry from all of this. Uh, and certainly the assessments were created uh, with the intention of having assessment capabilities. And so we're going to be looking at interesting <coughs> patterns of usage. To your question, are they using everything? Are they only self-selecting into some kinds of these things? I'm curious about the answer to that question. But also, am I able to take gameplay up to an assessment and predict the performance in the assessment? And can I revise that over time as they re-engage? Kids will engage and re-engage and re-engage until they get uh, bored with something they're age out. So the media strategy here is sort of working in tandem with the instructional and assessment strategy. Um, well, do they have a set of goals within the? In other words, over multiple trials. Yes. They, oh, yeah. Ah, so, so you can keep you. an inventory. Incentive and structures. Like, yeah. Yes. No, the incentive structure cumulative. You know, I've climbed. Yeah. I'm now at I don't know, climbing magma peak. I guess yeah. a volcano. So I go up. I'm now, you're right now at 10,000 feet, you know. You unlock, you're about to go to 11 or something. As you go, you're unlocking pieces of a statue for a statue island that rises out of the water. Here. Ah, there And you the go. statues are of your favorite <laughs> characters, and you're unlocking sticker books, and you're unlocking additional interactives. And so as you go, you're getting immediate rewards that you can then build a, like a puzzle into, into your favorite character, but you're also getting additional things that kids really love. For example, sticker books. Sticker books are a big thing. Stickers are a big deal to a three-year-old. But do you, do you give punishments, too? <laughs> <laughs> Suppose they yes. fail. We would, is, does their island start to collapse? Sure, they're back. <laughs> no, I'm just curious about your, 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 your experimental uh, incentive structure. The, the, the I don't think we of. punish them. <laughs> What's in, that? In the honest sense of that word. But we do give feedback intended to help them go metacog about certain things that maybe they're doing related to the curriculum. So you can you can say, oh, that, I don't think that worked. That's going to work at all because, or that kind of thing. And I'll, I'll talk about some of our feedback structures in the next product, uh, which is one of the, w one of our recent attempts to really get serious about instruction and feedback in very simple, and what that model looks like. Um, the other thing I'll point out about this product is that it was created, it was created out of a series of, of games that had been made across the course of the previous several years. They were all aggregated together because of their alignment to uh, the measurement topics. Uh, and so to some extent, it's a bit of a Frankenstein, uh, insofar as if we went and created every one of these interactives from scratch, all perfectly aligned to one single product strategy, we would actually, I think, be able to get even uh, an even better product than this was. But part of the goals of this was to prove that we could, in fact, get all of these things into one tablet app and distribute them in other places at the same time and have all the tracking working and have the real-time reports to parents working and have the assessment stuff um, function. We, we weren't quite sure we could get it all working all at the same time in the amount of time that we had. So this was sort of a, we got there, we did it, it's good. Um, okay, study design for this. Measure Up exists as a kid product. Supervision exists as a parent product. So three conditions. Uh, control gets other games that don't have anything to do with measurement. They don't get Measure Up or something. Condition, uh, second condition gets Measure Up only, for the kids. No parent connection. Third condition gets Measure Up plus the, the parent app. And the idea here is for us to tease apart any effects that we, that we find uh, that are pursuant to the, the use of the parent app. 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of debate right now about what you have to do to get a parent to want to engage in the tool. Right. Is this just a no-brainer? Are they going to use it? No, I don't think it is at all. In fact, I think this is a, a key challenge. Uh, parents will tell you that they really care. Parents will tell you that they want to be a good parent. It's aspirational. They will repeatedly give you false information about their expectations for how they will use the product like this. It isn't until you pin them down with crafty, crafty strategies to, 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 before you can start to get at the truth. One example would be uh, the third time, like I, got, I had them tell me what I wanted to hear through two different trials with parents, finding out what they think about it stuff sometimes. Finally, on the third trial, the innovation in the design was to have them plot their day before we show them any products or ask them anything about this. Plot their day. Then we had them circle the parts of their day where they think they're actively involved in parenting. So they did that. Then we showed them all the products. And then we said, hey, would you use it? And they told us the same story. Yeah, we would. And then we said, now please point on the diagram of your day where you would actually use this. And they were, finally, they all said, oh, yeah, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Because they're so busy. So that kind of but don't you think being able to tie it to something that was, I mean, if you directly show that it was a way to school readiness, you might be able to get parents more involved? I want that to be true, yeah. <laughs> Are you asking what I want? <laughs> no, I mean, I, is, that, is that something that, you, is that a strategy that you've explored further? Or? Uh, it's something that we're looking at now. We're definitely not giving up on this. This is, this is key. We already know that when the parent is involved, that the, the outcomes are way better. So but what about a build the child? game for the parent, you know. No, in other words, you, make, you gamify for the parent. You're, you're making the parent into some kind of wise educational minister. Yes. They're not. So you they're playing games too. Parent you parents. could even have pornography, I guess. I, something that would entice them. I, I'm just, you know, no, I'm sorry about pornography, but I'm just thinking how to motivate the parents. <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to innovate here. We need to manage the psychology of the parents. We need to meet them where they are. We need to use what they have, and we need to let them do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, 120 kids, 45, all uh, uh, gone through Title I. Uh, Pre-post on measurement concepts, parent questionnaire, plus telemetry. And we're going to package the data set up, the entire data set up. Uh, um, okay, uh, last part. Oh, we have a question? Oh, sorry. A quick question about the parental involvement. Uh, is it, uh, to what degree is it independent of the child's interest in the game? Because you, you, you said you concentrated a lot making it appeal to the child, but is, is the, does that also map onto how willing the parents are to have the children play these games, or is that a different set of? Can you answer it a different way? I might not be following the question. So, so like it's high engagement. Yes. Yeah, is high engagement correlated, like is high engagement by the child correlated with more engagement by the parent? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, that's something I think that we're going to be able to look at. We're doing data collection right now on those two products in the LA area with the, with the Title I kids. So that's something that, that we can look at in the, in the engagement analysis we're doing. Yeah. 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 I can just ask about your sample size. So, I mean, 120 across three conditions. Very small. That's pretty small, and you have a large grant. Why, oh. why not yeah. more kids? You get such a better signal. So our project is a tiny corner of the Ready to Learn grant. Okay. If, it, if I made it seem like I had a hundred million dollars. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> they make all the TV with that. Oh, okay. So that's two thirds that's two thirds of the money right there, and then another 25% of it is for the uh, research. So it is an economical decision. It's an economical okay. decision. But it's one I'd like to change. Do you have any? But the programs themselves are provided free to the, yeah. to the, the there's no sales to these educational products. Occasionally, PBS kids will make a, a, a product that we sell to recoup costs, yeah. um, but all of the ready to learn stuff uh, it endeavors to be free. And even in cases where we were unable to do that uh, for whatever reason, we uh, tend to try to make something like a voucher system so that if you wanted to get access to a free download code, you, you could. All right. Next up, I'm going to switch gears again, talk about the Rough Ruffman Show. This is more modern. This is part of the uh, current grant. Uh, it's Rough Ruffman Show. Um, we made an entire package of media around this. There's a number of different focus. But it, the key here is that it's science and that uh, we're, there's inquiry baked in across all of the products. But I'm going to zoom in 
on one product in particular. Uh, and I just want to call out WGBH Boston, one of our uh, local stations in the Boston area, is the producer of the Rough Rough Show and of the digital uh, assets that I'm going to show you today. We also have a universal design for learning strategy baked into these products that I'll talk about that we uh, developed in partnership with CAF. We've got the UCLA Crest folks, of course. And then I'm going to show you a Bayesian IRT implementation in uh, one of the products that's provided by Kidactive, who I mentioned earlier. Um, OK, learner-led, one key bucket of strategies uh, in the interactive. System-led represents the second key bucket of strategies. So in the learner-led side of things, you could think of it as being about choice to empower them. Uh, multiple modes of engagement with the topics, multiple ways to express what you know, multiple ways things are represented, that kind of thing. On the system-led side of things, there's a, a great feedback system and then uh, this IRT model I wanna show you. And again, assessment in the service of learning this time, we're trying to adjust the interve intervention behavior in real time as, as the kids play. So, um, so the setup here, uh, Ruff has lost his plushie, which he wants to give to his grandmother. It's out on the ice. He's tried to get it, but he slips with him. So he's got some frozen fists. He's going to slide them across the ice and knock them out of the way while avoiding penguins. It's a forces and motion curriculum, uh, pushes and, uh, and collisions and directionality, those kinds of things. Bigger pushes lead to uh, uh, bigger uh, collisions and bigger transfer of force, that kind of stuff. Two core modes of play. Uh, part of the universal design for learning strategy I mentioned. One is a challenge-oriented, task-positive um, uh, play mode. It's a challenge mode, what you might think of as normal gameplay. Another is a wide-open create mode that allows you to create whatever kind of level you want to create, which is super interesting. So two very different ways to interact with the same kind of sim, including being able to create. Uh, Lots of different kinds of challenges, though I'll show you more in the video, but uh, in principle there's uh, normal challenges, but then sometimes you have to adjust the force meter, and sometimes you have to adjust the location of the launcher, and sometimes you have to predict the path that the plushie will take, sometimes you have to predict the final resting place that the plushie will take, and sometimes you just have to get the plushie on, on the target. Uh, and in create mode, you, know, you see kids do all kinds of artistic and cool things. And a lot of times, they really like to make the hardest possible uh, level that they can. Um, but the idea is you can sort of create it, and then play it, and you can share it. And we've seen some, uh, you can't share it online. You can share it locally. But you, we've seen some awesome things happen. We've seen kids try to make things that nobody can solve. We've seen kids make things for their younger siblings to solve, determine that they were too hard, and then have them, uh, the older sibling, adjust the difficulty by changing the design of the level. So in, in a way, we've actually seen the create mode foster sibling peer-to-peer -peer social relationship that allowed a, a sibling to provide the adaptivity. A sibling is now providing the, the, the response of uh, correcting the difficulty of the level. UDL, I mentioned this stuff. I don't think I need to go over it, but yep, many ways to show it, you know, to interact and understand. One key aspect of this has to do with the force meter. Uh, it's material for any assessment uh, of your forces in motion knowledge. And I, I just have this slide to show that we went through many different iterations, uh, some of which were OK but too complicated, some of which were did not provide the uh, sufficient adjustability for kids to actually feel like they were tweaking things and getting into the sweet spot. And finally, a representation that's got the force represented in the force meter, as well as a gradient, as well as the numeral on the slider, as well as an audio cue that happens when you slide it up and down. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, many different ways to represent how much force you're uh, storing up to be launched by the launcher. Evidence specifications. I haven't talked too much about the details here, so I just thought it would be worth showing you a little bit. If we think it's related to engagement or learning, we try to collect it within reason. Um, that includes learner activity, that includes system state at every uh, action, and that includes system activity. So, uh, and then also, we'll decompose any, any of those. Uh, for example, we might say, instruction just started, and then another event, instruction just ended. And so we can keep track of timing, uh, we keep track of skips, we keep track of hovers. Um, it isn't just about learning, it's also about engagement. 
uh, states, uh, all anything really that we think might be relevant, we try uh, to put on file. And then this is a tool that as you play the game, you get to sort of see what's going by and whether your current data signature validates. It'll turn red and yellow here if, you, if you're messing up the data. Um, 256 levels. Theory here is really a theme and variation in the design. There's, uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen themes here and uh, an extended number of variations on each. The idea is to span the difficulty range all the way from the very easiest possible challenge, given this sim, all the way on up well past uh, the difficulty we think might be reasonable for this age target, and to try to keep uh, a, a small enough space between things that we're, not only do we have a good dynamic range, but we've got a good uh, spread across the difficulty spectrum for the, the, the items, the challenges. And, and the key question is, can we provide a challenge that's the right level of difficulty for this individual right here, right now? And how are we going to do that? Um, I put these slides in here to just go through Bayesian IRT. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I'm sure some of you know a lot more about this than I do. But I think about an analogy uh, with a vocabulary challenge and how some words are pretty easy to, uh, to see are, are easier, maybe, to define than others. And you can locate them on an item difficulty uh, scale. And that you might also be able to map learner ability, code co scale learner ability, so that maybe one individual is here uh, versus another individual is there. Anybody recognize this? It's Al Baldwin and Mariah OK, uh, so in this game, you might have a really easy challenge. You might have a really hard challenge. Um, and we start with a prior. Uh, that embeds our beliefs initially, uh, but that we could actually take some population data uh, if randomized sufficiently to inform what the prior should be. And each new little tidbit of information we get, uh, each item actually results in a new posterior that becomes the new prior. So we're continually adjusting uh, as we get uh, more and more evidence. And so we might start to zoom in on the, the location on the scale and we might start to uh, see our uh, standard deviation. We, we might start to see uh, confidence rise. And ultimately, we're hoping that we can locate and track uh, over time where this individual is right here, right now. Uh, we also, with the identity system and the account system, hope to be able to do that kind of thing across time and across experiences. Haven't done that experiment yet. But this is precisely the kind of thing that we would want to contribute to the learner profile that I showed on the, on the component diagram. And so, let's uh, open Facebook will be here. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about. So what do we learn from this, though? I mean, so I understand the IRT. I understand all that. But what do oh, I mean by it? the scale 2, scale 3? So, so in this particular game, I mean, just. So, so those 256 levels are yeah. all mapped on the same scale. No, so yeah. I can now hand select something, and with my estimator, I can say. But I'm just wondering. So yeah, 256. But I'm not exactly sure what the scale is here. I mean, I mean, what, what is it that I'm? What is number 250 versus 150? I mean, what? Well, I could. What am I learning about the kid? I guess. Oh, uh, in I mean, this case, that they. I mean, fish force may be interesting, but I mean, presumably, I wanted to map into some attribute. Yeah, the, the scoring model is uh, we, it's a partial credit model where depending on which attempt you get correct, we give you evidence for or against things like your forces in motion knowledge. So that might be one of the dimensions. Another dimension represented in the game might be uh, related inquiry. So are you actually reflecting on what happened in the previous round and making an adjustment that's I see. That so kind of self, sort of self awareness, yeah. some, some sort of Reflection. The underlying physical forces in motion about pushes and pulls, and then also at the, at the scientific end. Mm -hmm. But that's the attempt. Anyway. Have you tried to separate those out? I mean, it's, it's yeah. clear something's being learned, but I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, we've tried to separate them out. Really, it's about whether they're good at this game. Right, right. no. It's, <laughs> that by itself right. is not interesting. Yeah. Yes, but. Um, and, but, the, but yes, the, the scoring model is such that we believe that this ability is an ability on one of the dimensions that we've identified. And the dimensions we have identified are related to the learning time. In this case, the forces of motion curriculum in our, in our learning framework. There, there are a couple of little bullets, granular bullets in our learning framework that this game goes after. And we're saying that this is evidence of their ability on that dimension. But again, the question, I keep asking the same question can I relate it back to some other 
more conventional notion of what, I mean, well, so what am I learning about the previous, like social and emotional skills or Haven't, haven't done that this or, game? Or, yeah, I mean, it's like a new factor. I, I, I see. My fish force this. Or yeah, I see this as foundational to being able to go after that kind of question. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm but not you could sure. imagine designing a lot of games like this that would actually be, yes. be yeah. more focused on a given objective. Right, so, this is not around social and emotional learning. Right, this, this particular yeah. Game this particular mechanic or operation. Well, but there is a sense they would be persistent, right? That's it. yep. You, we could uh, we could definitely make a persistence metric in this game. part of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, the way that we would approach it, I think, is to to make several and then to see how those comport with behaviors that we observe in the real world. Yeah. So right now, you're predicting what's the next appropriate level and handing it to them, or are you giving them choices? We're estimating their level of success on the challenges in the, in the available set, and then handpicking a next level that we've tuned to around 70%. What we, what we estimate that they will have a 70% chance of succeeding on. Okay. And the, the, the underlying strategy there is that boredom and frustration are two ends of, uh, of a spectrum, each of which can lead to kids leaving. And that if we can prevent them from leaving because they're bored and prevent them from leaving because they're frustrated, not, not that all frustration is bad in a game. Some of it's really good, right? We know that, um, but it, gets, it can be too much. And if we can avoid them bouncing, then they'll engage with the game more. And if it has the instructional properties we want it to have, then the theory is that increased engagement would, would result in better outcome. And this may be getting a little to something Jim would be interested in, which is I, I think you're going to find individuals vary on that spectrum of how right. much challenge they want, right. right? How much they're comfortable with failing. Yeah. And you could, over the course of that a is lot of that's experiences, not in the model, but that's, that's really that. it could be. Yep. And, yeah. and it, so I'm always really keen to, to, to challenge anything on the system-led side that might actually be better on the learner-led side. So I would, I would counter that by saying another thing we could also look at would be if you could let the kid decide how hard, at what level of mm -hmm. consistent challenge they want. Mm -hmm. that would, that would, there would be a certain self-awareness they'd have to have for that. Which yes, which, which in and of itself, it would be great to foster that self-awareness <laughs> as, as a if, if the second set where you predict within a 70% interval, if it starts to prove to be too hard, does it automatically end up being easier? Yeah, it does not currently, but it could. Yeah. Something completely different, and uh, uh, but you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure how, how it squares with what, for example, before Greg presented on, on those who are stopping, for example. I'm not sure it's happening here, but maybe it's, it, it might be valid in, in the other games. Yeah. He's actually, you know, some sort of, not necessarily learning disabilities, but some dyslexia, for example, yes. which is very common, uh, much more today than what probably it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I wonder whether or not you can actually come in and not necessarily detect it, like medical doctors would do, but uh, help Correcting. I don't know, for example, the fact that they're not going to be able to understand the number three from the number five. And, uh, you know, maybe in the mid-ball uh, launcher game, that's one of the problems that some of the people might have had. And um, they might have stopped because they didn't realize how to recognize three from five. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, is there a way in which you can sort of uh, build that, one, and two, for example, if in fact these kids are followed into schools, uh, equip the school already to uh, have these as a as a warning system. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I think you could make something like that. I'm not. Well, I. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that that's a little like the idea that Michelle talked about yesterday. Yeah. If you have some hypothesis yes. about yeah. if there's a certain problem, you're more likely exactly. to see these kind of patterns. I'm going to look for them. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Where I'm weak exactly right. is I don't know how that particular case presents, but as long as it presents in a way that intersects with a game mechanic that we have under our control, then I, we could certainly make yeah. an interactive system that would would be able to detect that. I think. Yeah, and some diagnostics based on some assumptions, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, so okay, so just right. The second thing that I wanted to uh, get into about this game is the feedback system. Um, it's what we refer to as um, contextual. It's also graduated. 
and it's also multimodal. So the contextual piece of this um, refers to the fact that the system understands the need related to the challenge, and the system understands the attributes of the attempt, and it can compute the difference in a way that gives us useful information about what feedback to select. So it really does know what you just did, and it really does know what you needed to do, and it can, the system can solve itself, so it's, it can give us a lot of really great information about what you did and what you should have done and the difference. Second, the, the graduated is it doesn't always just give you the answer. Um, for a long time, you know, I saw a lot of, lots of folks who were saying, great job, and that was it. Well, that's not good enough. But then the, the opposite end of that spectrum is to say, no, you needed to do X, and that's not also not good enough. And is there a way to actually spawn their own curiosity, especially given our focus on inquiry, and say, hey, I wonder, do you wonder what would happen if that's the beginning? But we, we also reserve the ability to ramp up and provide more information beyond that in, in tiers. So maybe, you know, maybe we, we call out that you, you need to adjust the force meter, but we don't tell you up or down. And then maybe, maybe later in a number of attempts, maybe we actually do so we'll give you that level. The idea that maybe we can kind of meet, meet kids right where they are in terms of feedback need and not presume that they need to jump all the way to the, to the answer. It's a, a half decent attempt at this. I, I, we already have a lot of ideas just based on our early testing about how to make it uh, even way better, but it's, it's, it's good. And uh, yeah, he really does try to get the kids to think about things first, which I think is a useful strategy for us. Um, okay, so this is Sophia, she's eight, this is Nick, uh, he's four. I'm just gonna hop into a, a video real quick. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but I do wanna show you what this looks like side by side because it's, while it's not perfect, it does, it does, at this level of abstraction, it can't be perfect, but it does actually provide some interesting results when you see one individual go through the entire sequence of 10 introductory levels, which are fixed and the other individual go through those same 10 introductory levels, and then based on what they've done in those 10 levels, start to select a dynamic sequence from then on out throughout the rest of the game. And it, it, it has some interesting features on it. So. This is a subset of the intro levels. Cannon to push a fish at the plucky. Can you get it to the target? Tap the push button to launch a fish. So in the first level, all they can do is hit the launch button. It's just a, a game mechanic instruction. Now they know how to launch the fish. Next up, uh, they... Slide this to choose the force you need. So now they have to manipulate the force. Eight-year-old nails it. Four-year-old... You used just the right amount of force. Four-year-old gets a productive adjustment. Four-year-old does not well bang. Like <laughs> now you have to adjust the launcher position. We're isolating each of the mechanical factors in, in the system. Things are in the way! Wait. Bounce the plushie off the wall! Quick note about that. We introduced the launcher position by requiring a bank shot. Those are two things. I believe we made a mistake here. We did not isolate bank shot. It turns out the bank shot is incredibly difficult, and some of after we launched, we did some population level analysis to see where the highest bounce rates are. And guess what? Level four in the intro, where we conf where we co-introduced launcher position adjustment and requiring a bank shot, we have an outlier there. Tons of kids are bouncing there. So we, I believe we made a mistake in our in introductory sequence here. Aim at the star. Eight-year-old does pretty well. Four-year-old. So, air, air that great. counts! We sped up time here just to show you what, what happens with the four year old. This is affecting each each of these attempts. Actually, our scoring model only counts the certain number of the, the, the first attempts. But, but this, this is affecting his ability estimate and affecting our certainty. Got it. <laughs> Uh, so now we're level 11. This is where the uh, kid out the IRT model starts selecting the next challenge, uh, or informing the selection of the next challenge. Okay, so the eight-year-old gets, a, gets a, a, a penguin here. The four-year-old also gets a penguin, but the eight-year-old has moved into a new tier of challenge. These stars, you, there's dotted line stars here. It might be hard to see up there, but 
this, uh, the ear has selected these stars as a prediction about the path that this plushie will take, given the fact that their force meter is locked and given the fact that the launcher is locked into position. So the ear really is predicting the path now. It's a different kind of challenge. And it's one that's intended to elicit thinking about what a prediction is and what it's for in the process of inquiry. The four-year-old gets another bank challenge. Otherwise, they could place the launcher right here and have a straight shot, but, the, but this static penguin is not, not going to permit that. So really, one of the most efficient solutions is to do another bank shot. So the system has actually sent the four-year-old into a, the simplest possible bank shot and, and forced a bank solution. It matched your prediction. Oh. Good one. Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> I love this job so much. <laughs> Prediction time! Um, Tap okay. on the ice to put a target where you think the plushie will land. Now they're both into uh, another kind of prediction where the target selection uh, means you are predicting ahead of time what this configuration will do in terms of final resting place. So it's not path anymore. Uh, it's where, where will the thing wind up? Uh, and the key the difference here is that the eight-year-old, the system has selected a level that, in my opinion, is much harder because this is a moving penguin, which introduces a new variable, which is timing. Now you've got a twitch aspect of this, and you have to successfully time your launch or uh, you will fail. Or move <laughs> where the plushie will go so it doesn't hit a penguin? Okay, so the intent here was to show that the paths diverge, the level selection is different for each, and that it's in some cursory way, it seems to be doing its job. It's not perfect, it's not as good as whether a, a human would hand select uh, the next level, I think, and it's not as good as, uh, the, the feedback isn't perfect either, but it's, it's getting somewhere. And so one of the things that we really want to uh, test uh, as we do some research on this, is how much of a how much of an incremental benefit does it really represent? For example, what if we did random level selection versus the Bayesian IRT? What if we took the game producers uh, and said, "Hey, we want you guys to come up with your own algorithm and we compete that." So, in other words, what we might have done if we hadn't tried to implement uh, Bayesian IRT? So, we've just got a couple different conditions that we're thinking. About. Uh, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let's turn into <coughs> the slideshow mode instead of, okay, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, from a tooling perspective, we've actually uh, made a little uh, Fish user, force. user interface that as I play the game, uh, my toy plushie is stuck the on head. the penguin's ice. Help me get it out! This is a work in progress right now. I'm sort of showing you. Play a level or tree. Oh, yeah. there's a penguin on the ice. You might need to move the cannon. What do you guys think? Maybe 35? <laughs> oh. uh, so that counts. Sweet! My, uh, Tap next to try another level or retry to try this level again. And my standard deviation. And I, I never did mention the multimodal part of the feedback. That's, this guy flies around, can light things up with visual cues and all that, that, that sort of thing. So we try to provide the feedback and instructions in different ways. Which stars will the plushie oh, hit? My. 50? Yeah, that's about right. <coughs> uh, all this to say that... It matched your prediction! It's good. Sweet! to show people what's going on under the hood so that we can scrutinize this and criticize it. Uh, and s did it do what I expect it to do? So this, you know, maybe there's some some tooling that helps us every now and then with, with uh, Facebook. Uh, do you have any sense of how many kids are playing the game as intended, or how many kids just want to play the game to see how far they can hit the penguin? Like how far they can just knock them? No, but the telemetry would permit that kind of, we, we would be able to inquire in the telemetry for that kind of thing. Although, ascribing to their motivations may be a step too far. Yeah. We would be able to see the factual basis that we would interpret that way. 
maybe a bunch of kids are doing all kinds of stuff, but but saying that they're just trying to get it to go as far as it is, I mean, how do you, how do you Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if, it, if you, you want to assess their performance, I mean, may, maybe they're, if it's a really creative kid that's just trying to learn what they can do with now, yes, okay, now, I may understand a little more about your question. Yes, one thing that we intend to do is try to characterize how systematic a sequence of attempts is versus how stochastic it is. If they are messing about, which is a productive activity in inquiry, you might anticipate that their attempts really don't have that much relation to one another, that much of a pattern. And you might also anticipate that, that how systematic their attempts are could grow over time as they start to understand the simulation. And then you start to see things like when something stops short, they identify the force slider correctly, and maybe they adjust it in the proper direction correctly, and maybe they adjust it in the correct magnitude. And each of those are an additional level of rise of certainty that they are, are getting what's going on. But I think there's a game. difference between saying they're not systematic and potentially being systematic around a different goal mm -hmm. or a different question. Right. And if right. I may say, in, you know, just some of the, the analysis article. I've done on, on, on the microbe game, after they've won a level, yeah. their play becomes extremely erratic. They'll go back to the same level and do all sorts of weird stuff, which yeah. I, I think there's a wealth of they interesting inquiry data in there. What are they yeah. exploring after yeah. they've already won? Yeah, I, I, yes, they want to break it. They want to push the boundaries of the system. They want to find yeah. out where the boundaries are. And couldn't, couldn't we be designing experiences that let them do that on purpose? And then looking at that, mm -hmm. I think we could. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just briefly, the feedback system operates within uh, a challenge. The so certain strategies would be very creative, others less so. So there's, okay. I, I'm just again trying to map it in. So yeah. you think you could measure some kind of potential at least for yeah. thinking out of the box? Or I think so, and especially in the create mode. If, yeah. if you're talking about creativity, oh yeah. yeah. Self-selecting in the create mode, time spent in create mode, number of levels created in create mode, right. uh, complexity of creations in create mode. Right. I have video, if you want to see, uh, of a kid doing some pretty funny stuff in create mode. But uh, if you were doing this like in real time, so you're going it through a course of a year, mm -hmm. then the game, they, they figured it out in the first month or so, yeah. right? So then how do you push them the next step forward to still get at that? Yeah. You have to give them a sequence. I don't know how, if you thought forward, the, in, what the sequence of games would be that would essentially not make it ah. boring and repetitive, right? Yeah. And then still measure some of the same fundamentals. Yeah, they, well, when they have choice, they get really good at like, getting out of it when they're done with it. They, okay. These phases that we were just talking about, messing about, right. starting to become more systematic and focused on it, is true of a subset of the population who is task-oriented. And then, typically, there might be a phase after that where they, do, they try to break it, and some of them actually try to break it. But, but maybe, and then, and then after that, it's like, I'm out. I'm, I'm going to do something else. Do something else. Yeah. yeah. So but you we, have a next step, step for, uh, for Well, yeah. we don't have it. Have, don't have it yet. Yeah, okay. yeah, we, yeah. yeah. so the, the feedback is operating at the challenge level. The selection of a level might be operating inside of a game level. But the, there's another frontier here, which is pathing in what we call the shepherd. Uh, and pathing through the library. What is the next game? What is the next video? What is the next? And from my sense, obviously, we're going to try to inform it with our expert opinion. But I would also like to be empirical about ordering. In so many cases, I see people so with such conviction about sequencing of instructional topics, and then it doesn't bear out in the data. And I just wonder, like, is it more important to do it in a particular order, or is it, or is it more important just to make sure that it was done at all? And how, in how many cases is each of those things true, and under what domains? I don't know the answer to any of those. But I, but I believe that we have the mechanism by which we could ask them yeah. in a system like this. There's a guy named uh, Peter Robinson who was working on something like this in language instruction. Very, very similar. Um, there, it, the idea is that in language, there are always many things going on at different levels, the pragmatics, the syntax, the, the vocabulary. So rather than just study vocabulary by itself, you're always doing something that is rich, but it's only pushing out like one or two of those dimensions. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's worked out this theory about optimal ways in language learning of moving you up through increasingly greater proficiency and never breaking you. That's awesome. Yeah. We, we try in our instructional design to deal with what we call cross-cutting concepts and the 
the big, big ideas and our yeah. learning permits and so forth, and we try to have those pervade everything, but I don't believe we have yet done some detail level telemetry level work on, on cross cutting and trying to tease all these things apart simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you an email about it. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. And then, okay, just to wrap up then. Uh, so it's oh. in the form of a game? No, it's a form of a curriculum. Of a curriculum? Yeah, they're so not they games, can, but they're, they're like um, role play what age level? I mean, sort of, what age level? Um, I think he is working with uh, middle school through adult. I see. Yeah. And yeah. There, there's a lot of engagement by the kids. Yeah, yeah. I just worry, I mean, just wonder if it, this, this has got to get a lot of excitement and pizzazz about it. I don't know about taking him through a language instruction course. That sounds a little more. I assume exactly. you guys have language as we, well. We yeah. do literacy as well, yeah. and, and we just uh, commissioned a property whose core focus will be informational text. Uh, okay. mm. Sweet spot of six. Mm -hmm. I can't talk much about it. It's, it's not okay. um, yeah, imagine what does adaptivity or personalized learning look like in the context of informational text? Got to figure it out. It's one of the things we're doing. Um, okay, so studies. Boy, howdy. We're going to do population data analysis on fish force for a long time. Uh, anytime we have a good idea, we'll start down that road, and we'll occasionally get distracted by other better ideas, and we're just going to keep pressing on things. Um, my interest typically is in characterizing the variety that exists in the population. Um, and I'm interested in, in variability, and I'm interested in using that to our advantage to help serve individuals. Um, but there's also a lot of engagement level stuff like, okay, the game is busted here at level four, we're gonna fix it, can we scrutinize that part of it and figure out how we can improve? Um, there's uh, an ex uh, uh, another study that we're planning on doing uh, where we're gonna have the adaptive level sequencing of the IRT, the Bayesian IRT model, also a producer design level sequencing and also a random level sequencing. We're in the process of kind of designing this one right now. Would love any thoughts about this uh, study, um, five, six-year-olds, <coughs> forces in motion concepts, street cl classification modeling, <coughs> uh, and then, yeah, always trying to package up the data set, the reference data set. Um, so, oh, yeah, and then um, the, uh, oh, God, the EEG stuff. Yes, so many different <laughs> data streams, simultaneous, uh, and we want to get good at doing analysis across them and the relationships between them. So it might be screen cap, might be vid cap, might be um, the telemetry uh, and, and other things, uh, and co doing the coding and doing the analysis to line up that stuff. For example, if we come up with an interesting measure on the telemetry side of things, does it bear out with what we observe in the real world? Um, always the focus on trying to convince ourselves that this stuff is real and relates back to something important um, in, the, in the real world. Uh, implications to the future. We are always learning about uh, getting new evidence and figuring out what to collect and what's useful, uh, what level of detail. Oh, geez, I'm in the process of completely revamping that analytics system that I showed you guys. It was It's great from an assessment perspective, but what it doesn't, so, currently do well is support personalized and adaptive experiences. It's based on an analytical model that's implemented in, in a cloud, and I need to be able to support adaptivity in the client, and so we're working on a, a corresponding sibling that functions in the client so that if a kid takes a tablet offline because they're in the car and they're not on Wi-Fi, that I can do the appropriate subset of metrics that are required to, to drive the game behavior even offline. And, and then also do the synchronization response uh, required when you come back online, that kind of thing. So um, always wondering what the designs are to help us uh, increase uh, our own confidence that what we're doing is useful for the reasons that we, that we would like it to be useful for. I'm, I've only showed you one personalized and adaptive learning approach. There are at least seven, possibly nine, that we'll be doing in between now and the end of the five-year grant. Each has their own set of experiences. Uh, but by the time we're done with the grant, they will all actually relate to one another from a product viewpoint. So stretching across a number of different approaches, really want to model thought processes. I'm incredibly 
interested in the kind of work that you're doing. Um, not just, I mean, starting with the fact that you're connecting the cognitive side all the way through to the, uh, the, the far end, but, but also just the idea that thought processes themselves might be something that we have an agenda about and that we could possibly optimize, especially around inquiry. Um, uh, yet reporting and recommendations had a lot of st struggle getting parents to engage. Definitely going to be doing more work. I, I think one of the big secrets here is going to be start where they are, which means probably hit them up through Facebook Messenger, probably hit them up <laughs> through things like that as opposed to asking them to download a second app. Uh, so I think we put a lot of things, a lot of hurdles in their way that we didn't need to. Um, so we, you didn't show us too much about the engagement of the parents and teachers here, this ecosystem. No. Like in the fish force, were there ever parents involved? In the, parent re the parent reporting aspect of fish force hasn't been developed yet. We just launched the product. So it, it all sort of stretches out over time. But by the time we're done, fish force will contribute some of the information that makes up our messaging strategy in a unified parent. But what would the parents do with it? So they see the kid is doing well at fish force, but yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm still not quite sure what fish force is telling me. But yeah. But Fish Force is telling you whether the kid understands that larger pushes. No, no, I understand that. Oh, but you did. <laughs> that, I, but I, but, I, but I am. I'm just trying to relate it to something about you know the developmental process of the kid and so on. But what would the parents do? So, I think okay. parents would like to see a spectrum of uh, as a parent, you know, ABCs, language, science, math, right, whatever. Exactly. So I think if it's organized appropriately and delivered to parents. They want to see the map filled in. With yeah, yeah exactly. so, right. And, yeah. and then other things that are. I mean, this looks art. like an interesting game, but then I say it's a distraction. They should be learning their alphabet or something, right? Uh, so that's an interesting. You know, ABCs, one, two, threes are one thing, but um, the process of inquiry itself. Is no, I agree. But I mean, I'm just wondering how you get them to be engaged. The parents themselves may not be very. So the pro inquiry. It's you know, going to have to be something they care about. But you need a lesson. I, I think you need to build a lesson plan that takes the yeah. uh, kids through some s specified direction, yeah. with or without a parent involved. Yeah. Uh, On one level, some may be happy just knowing that it happened because they're interested in their kids getting wholesome education. But like uh, the teacher, I could see he looks at, the, she looks at the fish forest. The kid is experimenting. You can see this kid. So if the kid, ha if the teacher has any capacity to kind of individuate, mm -hmm. then might sort of take, you know, accelerate the kid, do certain things, mm -hmm. and so forth. Could you imagine changing a parent's behavior to want to get in involved in that kind of thing? There, I can imagine you could, yeah. but it's a little more, it's not just giving them the information on the fish force game, I guess. I right. Mean, right. You'd have to put it in context. You, you would tell them tell that they're the struggling parent. with this thing and here's something exactly. you can do. This is where your kid is, you know, And that's good exactly what supervision and, does, yeah. Yeah, or where the kid is, has strengths or weaknesses. And, yeah. Yeah. If, if I may make a recommendation, partly it's apparent, I think uh, the aggregate interpretations are very hard to do anything with, right? Yeah. I almost wonder if anecdotal, you know, like here's, Here's a level your your child yeah. solved today. I agree. Yep. Right, would be more enticing. Heartstrings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Things that they can relate to. Things, Things they'd be they proud of. We we started off with a sort of get grass strategy, which I don't think is working. Uh, and so a lot of us have come to a very similar conclusions that you have to really do stuff that they care about. And one of the things that we found is that they tell you that they care about the things that you care about, but they then we find empirically that they don't care about those things. So now we're, we're thinking about a model where we bring a small group of parents that are with us the whole time in at the very beginning and even the, any measure that we pull out of the game that we believe in, we put in front of a team of parents and we say, do you even understand what this is? Do you perceive any utility for this for you at all? What story would we tell to you with this? And then anything that doesn't make any sense to them in general, we, we toss out and the stuff that's left is the utility. Uh, question or comment, I don't know. I mean, I mean, this is super impressive and it's potentially super relevant. I mean, I think there's no doubt about it. But? Like massive. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of a scientific evaluation, I'm, I'm pretty much lost, to be honest. We're talking about a very complex treatment, and we are talking about a potentially very complex set of outcomes. Um, and we're talking about features of these, say, games, like, in my view, if, if you want to do a scientific analysis and run experiments, 
to really pin down what they are. So let me start with the uh, outcome variables. I mean, we have seen one learning test or some, I, I don't even know that kind of test. It may be a good test, I'm not, you know, there's no doubt about this, but I could see many, many other potentially very relevant outcomes of an intervention like this or of engagement. One example is, suppose people are engaging in teamwork or cooperative play, you know, social skills could also be fostered by, by you know, playing these games for them. Cognitive skills, very broadly defined. I mean, there's so many things that could potentially go on. Visual perception capacity, what not, uh, uh, motoric capacities, etc., etc., etc. And there are well-defined notions and concepts behind these potential outcome variables that you should, you know, kind of systematically assess. That's part one. The other is, to me, these are very, you know, unspecific treatments. You're going from one game to the other, and changing one item here and another there. Uh, what I would like to see, maybe that's asking for too much, I don't know, I'm not an expert at all, is to strip down what is what are the essential features of these games, right? And then systematically vary, you know, plug on and off, right? These on and off, these, these potential features. And then have a comprehensive systematic design where you say, in combination with, you know, feature A, B, and C, outcome one, two, and three are positively affected or negatively affected, whatever, or there's no effect whatsoever. You know, somewhat more discipline, I guess, is what I would have liked to see. So I don't exactly know what I, you know, can it, get from what I've seen. In so some sense, I think we're, we're headed that way. I mean, we're, what we're doing in, at its core is laying the groundwork to be even able to do that. But you could vary. I mean, this is just one of many. Yeah, it's just one of many. And so, I mean, you could target it more specifically. If you were, if you were looking like at math skills, like mm -hmm. certain numeracy, you could imagine, I mean, I, I haven't designed ever one of these games, I could imagine how you'd start doing that. And that's, you already have some of those in inventory, right? Yeah. yeah Something very it. specific, very simple that would sort of meet. This is more complex, the fish game, but yeah. uh, it's still, you could vary that in several different ways. Yeah. Many different Interesting. Ways. Yeah, interesting. And, th and that's definitely on the roadmap. This is what we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was related question. It's like, is there something you try to maximize, like um, increase in a specific skill or a specific domain, conditional on available effort or something? For a bunch of kids' games, um, I don't know that we're there. Uh, we. For example, in the Fish Force game, we are definitely trying to keep them around. Uh, so that's one metric by which we might help inform whether we set it at 70% prediction of success or lower or higher, that kind of thing. Um, if you want to talk about a meaningful, like comprehensive outcome, we're not there. We've got a library, but it's not all instrumented. But therefore, I'm asking, what are you trying to maximize? <laughs> Uh, in this game, or do you mean long term? With the, with the whole setup. It, 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 with the whole setup, ultimately what I would like to do is have enough uh, representations of force and motion and enough representations of this math field and enough representation of the social and emotional all feeding into a vector of the learner that itself has an interpretive layer on top of it that we could argue about for years about all the hypotheses about how to take those inputs and, and turn them and do all the analysis for all those really high value inputs and determine what they are predictive of. So am I, I am not necessarily trying to maximize any individual outcome at this time. I am trying to make a system by which we have reasonable extraction of high value tidbits about individuals and we co-locate those things so that we can take that profile and try to do productive things with it. So that gets to something I've been wanting to ask, which is how can you be certain that what you're seeing is the child, a particular individual interacting with the app versus the parent helping them, oh, a yeah. sibling, I a friend mean, doing so some sort of co-op mode? No, there's definitely going to be noise like that. Do you have and any? They, they have, yeah, we, we've done some uh, prototypes on facial recognition mm -hmm. uh, and age detection. 
it's early in that space. I don't have a lot of confidence in it right now, but the idea was to be able to determine whether there's more than one peer or an adult and child scenario going mm -hmm. on at the same time and pass back and forth. There are some self-selection strategies that we tried, uh, which work relatively well when it's kids. They effectively roll down to safe slots. The idea that you can create your little avatar and you have your own little slot and there's multiple slots available to you. Because when you give the kids things that they can make and save and care about, then they want to keep them under their own little toy box, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've done some things to try to get the kids to tell us, but that we're never going to fully solve that one. But isn't the goal here at the end of the day is to try to get the lower income kids that aren't going to nursery school and have parents that are sitting down with them and teaching them to catch up to their peers when they enter kindergarten? Yeah. Because obviously the big issue in K through 12 is d depending on your socioeconomic uh, 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 place is, is you're just behind and therefore you're spending a lot of time trying to get those kids to catch up to the, 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 their, their peers. So at the end of the day, I believe that's what PBS is yeah. all about. Yeah, that's so. true. We, but, all. but given this target, then we have a metric we can judge if, if something goes in the right direction yeah. or not. Because then well, they need to follow them further beyond this, which right. is yeah. we don't the have next step. Data in school. We, <laughs> right. we don't think about things broader than our own stuff. That's one of the reasons we're here. Is this, yeah. is this a part of the project <laughs> potentially you got this, this long-run perspective? Not when it comes to ready to learn. Nope. That, that's one of the reasons we're here reaching out is to make the connections that might allow us to ideate about what we should be doing in that. Uh, like, uh, even for this long-term goal, I mean, if we have intermediate steps, though we know they are predictive of you know closing the gap between say high level yeah. and social level steps. Like scores right. on the team of three, for exactly. Example. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but, but following them is, is essential. I mean, to be able to follow them, I think, is really the essential. The team of three takes too long. Yeah. You need, yeah. obviously, these other kings. So, so yeah. let me just say, say, you guys are, I mean, I love you guys since I was a kid, so you're awesome, man. It's <laughs> great. Um, but you are, uh, to be honest, a huge confound in every developmental study ever done. <laughs> <laughs> you are like lead, right? Unmeasured, pervasive, and having a huge effect on everybody, and we don't measure so if you think about it from a developmental perspective, you know, if I'm running a study, any study, education, development, psychopathology, whatever you want, health, at least half my kids are doing your product. You are a huge intervention, right? And it's so, your fault. Am I it's your happy? fault too. <laughs> <laughs> you screwed it all up. Instead of thinking in terms of like how do you bridge from what you're doing to doing clean experiments and or measuring things because all these things are really hard, you've got dozens if not hundreds of longitudinal teams in the field right now working with kids. If you can create a system where you simply give them in a research capacity the ability to tap into your system and track the kid, yeah. you get the IRB approval from the parent that the PBS folks will work in coordination. So you don't do anything. You don't design studies. You just give your information to those researchers who can design studies who are measuring these things. That sounds great. That's easier way to do this than to toil through all the different necessities. I mean, I think it would be great if you guys could do a lot We also want to get better at making the intervention too, so we're going to continue you got, tons, you got tons of people out there running, and you are so pervasive. I, I, you know, I want to ask even a and so would be willing question. To yeah. team up. Here's what I want. Because they, 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 I mean, I don't see how a, long, a developmental researcher wouldn't want to know. Yeah, yeah. great. So, awesome. But that, that's a different... Here's what I really want. That's I think that the... If you look at a kid from a whole child perspective and you look and acknowledge at how jarring the transition from maybe not even having preschool is to going into kindergarten, what I would like to do is prepare them. So you hear a lot of people talk about kindergarten readiness. We could argue for a long time about what that means. I'm not even sure I know. But what the measure that I then would have to care about would be did they absorb more from whatever kindergarten they wound up getting than they otherwise would have? That's the you, that's what I ultimately want to optimize for. You. Back, back to you, but that's what I want. I want to know that we're spending money to make this media, and that it actually has an effect of getting a body of kids to get more out of the kindergarten than they otherwise.